Рад приветствовать вас на конференции Mobius. Меня зовут Дима Смиринов. Я занимаюсь дизайн-системами последние несколько лет. И в данный момент разрабатываю такую для компании «Кошелек». Сегодня буду выступать в роли эксперта. Пока у нас есть еще немного времени, хотелось бы напомнить зрителям, что вы можете задавать свои вопросы в чате в Телеграме. Вы сможете после доклада оценить его. И не, никуда не убегайте после доклада, нас ждет дискуссионная зона, там будет очень увлекательно. Что ж, сегодня наши друзья из компании Stream собираются рассказать о своем опыте разработки Production Ready Chat SDK на Jetpack Compose. И я думаю, это будет очень увлекательно. So, guys, I believe that everyone who have ever tried to build user interface using Jetpack Compose will never come back to Android View framework voluntarily. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I just jumped ahead a bit when I, before I muted my mic. Uh, so, yeah, definitely I agree with that. I think we have this experience in stream. We're astonished by how awesome Compose is, how easy it is to work uh, with Compose and build new and awesome, exciting SDKs and just in general UI um, APIs. Um, we managed to do a lot in, in a few months with Compose, as we'll discuss in the presentation. And overall, we, we've been just like moving forward with Compose very, very quickly. So, yeah, Martin, anything to add? Yeah, we, we can also like definitely say upfront that for developer happiness of uh, being able to work on UI uh, that's built in Compose versus having to create custom views and edit XML code and uh, trying to figure out XML resources and theming. Uh, compared to that, uh, like all, all of the developers that we had work on Compose, including Philip and I and others, uh, have, have had really positive things to say about it. Uh, and they were yeah, much, much more enthusiastic about uh, building UI uh, when they could use Compose for it just because it's so much easier. Like you, you don't feel like the system is fighting you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, we, yeah, I was going to say like definitely we've had some situations where we've been struggling with XML for for a specific implementation for a long time, and then like in Compose you managed to do it very very easy in just like a few hours. So yeah, definitely can attest that. Yeah, and we're already tired of writing match parent wrap content and such <laughs> boilerplate in XML, and uh, also. Interoperability is great, right? So migrating yeah. to Jetpack Compose is very nice and easy and comfortable. Yeah, yeah the, the whole so. thing is uh, really, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that you can use both Compose in XML and XML in Compose. So uh, yeah, essentially we've managed to have a client actually that used our XML views in their Compose um, application. And then when we launched Compose, they managed to just like switch over. Uh, so there are some like uh, already real world applications here that we can attest to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is that the whole migration feels a lot like going from Java to Kotlin, like in, in many, many aspects. Um, so for one, you have the great interoperability, which means that you can do it uh, gradually. You can use these two things side by side for a while in an application. And yeah, the same for developer happiness. Like with, with Kotlin, I think one of the major things that pushed us towards using it initially was that people were just happier to write Android apps if they could use Kotlin for it. And yeah, the same is now happening for Compose, basically. When I say developer happiness, I feel completely agreed. <laughs> Because when I started this uh, using Compose, I felt actually very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> As compared to XML, right? <laughs> yeah. So, guys, uh, if you feel ready, maybe we can start the talk. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And thank you for being here uh, and just having like a small chat with us. Uh, as Dimitri mentioned, we, we are going to talk about building a production-ready chat SDK using Jetpack Compose. Uh, this is going to be us sharing uh, some of the experience overall, how we built our SDK, what things we met along the way, uh, and essentially how we approach building our SDK as compared to our users and what they need. So my name is Filip Babich. Uh, I'm the lead entry developer for Jetpack Compose at Stream, which means that I 
manage more or less the Compose development. I've uh, also written a huge part of the Compose SDK initially, and now I'm working together with the rest of the team to make it even more uh, functional, even more uh, with even more features, and just in general on par with all of the other SDKs that we provide. I'm also a GD for Kotlin and Android, so I do a bunch of uh, content creation, published speaking, and st stuff like that, as you can see. Uh, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn, more or less. Uh, but essentially, uh, it's best to reach out to me on Twitter. And here's Martin, who will give you a bit more information on what uh, we are doing with Compose. Uh, yeah, so uh, hi, my name is Martin Brown. I work as an Android developer advocate for Stream, which means it's my job to make sure that developers know that our SDK exists, but also that they find it uh, enjoyable to use, that the APIs are all good and that we provide a sensible experience to our clients. Uh, if you want to reach out to me at any point, uh, the best uh, way is also probably on Twitter. And you can also find all the things that I'm up to uh, on my website, which you can uh, find on the screen here. Uh, for my bio, I just stole Philips uh, because we do very, very similar things. Um, so I'm also a GD for Kotlin and Android. And I also do public speaking writing and uh, those sorts of things. All right, uh, let me uh, dive into uh, what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, we're going to start with why Jetpack Compose, uh, why it's exciting in general, and why it's exciting for us at Stream specifically. Then we're going to tackle the question of whether Compose is ready to use in production and what our experience has been like trying to use it, or well, using it, not trying. Um, then uh, we're going to talk a bit about our component design system that we came up with for Jetpack Compose. Uh, to provide easy to use uh, chat components. Then we're going to address some common pitfalls and some concerns that you might have about um, moving from XML to Compose. We're going to give you some tips and best practices about how to make your Compose code and your Compose components readable. And finally, we're going to show you how we allow customization of our UI components um, using Compose's uh, various features. So first things first. Uh, why Jetpack Compose? Well, uh, we strongly believe, uh, just like Google and the Android developer community at large does, that Jetpack Compose is going to change Android development forever. Mostly, it offers faster and more efficient development, uh, which we can definitely attest to both of those things. And it, of course, has some learning curve. But after you get the basic concepts of Compose down and you understand how you're supposed to think and compose, uh, the API itself is fairly intuitive, and you also get to use things like auto-completion in the IDE to um, figure out what APIs are available and how to call them. So it's actually really easy to discover Compose once you've uh, gotten started with it successfully. Compose, just like many other modern UI toolkits, uh, like SwiftUI or React or Flutter, is a declarative UI toolkit. This is something that it looks like modern toolkits are just gravitating towards all of them. Uh, because apparently it's a really good idea to model UI as a function of state, some kind of data. And in Compose specifically, we can create these components as functions, which gives us really nice uh, flexibility. In Kotlin, it's, we can do a lot of powerful things with functions, as you know. So these two things together uh, provide really deep and uh, really um, flexible uh, features. And we get language consistency from Compose as well. Uh, after a long time of having to develop our layouts in XML code and then having executable code in Java or Kotlin on the other side and having to somehow bridge these by uh, looking up views by ID or uh, doing view binding or data binding and then having to worry about syncing state from the executable part of your code to the XML view hierarchy. All of this is going to be gone in Compose. Uh, here we are only writing code in one language, in Kotlin. And uh, we also get to do that, of course, with the Kotlin editing features that we're used to. So we do this in Android Studio. We can do things like look up usages, navigate to declarations, uh, write documentation for each component, because they're all just functions. So uh, this is really, really powerful, and it makes it really easy to write Compose code. OK, then. So why is Jetpack Compose interesting for Stream? Uh, well, we're all about meeting users where they are. So our product is a backend chat service so that you don't have to implement that yourself. Uh, that's what we offer. And we also build clients, open source clients, for lots and lots of platforms because we really want you to have access to 
uh, whatever uh, is the most idiomatic way to call things on your platform. So for example, on the client side, we offer React, but also React Native, Android, iOS, um, written in Swift, and Flutter SDKs. And now we're also offering Compose. And on the server side, we also offer just lots and lots of different SDKs. Um, so um, for example, if you're writing a Spring application or a Node app or something in Go or Ruby, we are providing a client for all of those because we want it to be easy to use our SDK. And again, we're doing the same thing for Compose. We really want idiomatic Compose APIs uh, that we can provide. Well, interop is a great Compose feature, and you could use our XML-based views from Compose as well. We don't want you to have to do that because it's still not as convenient as if they were written in Compose. So we built all of our Compose components from scratch. There's no interop happening anywhere. All of it is pure Compose code. Compose is also an excellent match for the customization needs of our SDK. So our clients drop our chat components into their application, and we want those chat components to feel native within whatever the application's design looks like, which means that we have to offer a lot of different customization options. And Compose is an awesome match for this in two ways uh, that are really major. One of them is the theming capabilities that Compose has, so that you can not only customize each individual component through its parameters, but you can do global customization that will affect all of the components. And the other is slot APIs, uh, which is, again, something very specific to Compose. And we're going to touch on this a bit later on to show you what it looks like. And these two things together uh, really uh, provide the power that we want to give to our customers to customize our uh, SDK. And these things were very, very difficult in some cases with views and XML. And in some other cases, they were downright impossible. So being able to not just provide these in Compose, but to make them really easy is like a huge change for us. OK, and so is Compose ready to use in production? Uh, we actually don't have a lot to say about this, uh, because what we're going to say here is that we believe it's been stable for quite a while now. Uh, we never had any performance or stability issues with it of any kind. And we've been using it since the first betas, at the very least. Uh, we built the entire uh, SDK, well, most of the uh, SDK's initial version, while Compose was still in a beta version. And then we released the first official release uh, once Compose became stable. Uh, we were actually there on day one, because we could build all of this in betas, because they were good enough for that. Uh, of course, um, while the core APIs of Compose are stable, there are some things that are still uh, being developed. So uh, some parts of the API that still need more work. And you can mostly avoid the experimental APIs in your day-to-day -day work, but it's still worth knowing that they exist because you might have to still interact with them in some cases. So some APIs specifically that are experimental. So first, there are the accompanies libraries, which are a set of libraries by Google. So they're first party, but they're not released as Jetpack libraries yet. Uh, because their APIs are not final and they're not quite stable yet. Uh, things like uh, some navigation things are in there, as well as um, dealing with insets, for example, or swipe to refresh things. So it's things where Google has some idea of what the solution should be and has some implementation for Compose, but it might change uh, later down the line. There are also some lazy APIs that are still experimental. So the most important lazy things like uh, lazy column and lazy row are uh, already stable and you can use them. But if you want, for example, sticky headers or if you want lazy grids, then uh, those are still marked experimental. So you should be aware that you might need to change code later if you uh, decide to use those. And then finally, there are also some modifiers and some overloads of material components like uh, clickable cards and surfaces. A lot of things around complex click handling, where again, the APIs are not yet guaranteed to be final. So uh, be prepared to do some maintenance on the code if you decide to use those APIs. For a bunch of these APIs, you're also going to have to opt into them explicitly, uh, which uses uh, Kotlin's and also Android's opt-in mechanisms, uh, which are worth being familiar with if you're using Compose, because you'll sometimes run into them. And I actually wrote a large guide on how to create declarations like this that are experimental, and also on how to opt into them as a user. So uh, this is probably worth checking out if you're going to be using Compose. With all of that, uh, we can uh, say that as far as we are concerned, Compose is production ready and also here to stay. 
we managed to build a really good initial version of our Compose SDK in just a couple of months. Uh, Philip pretty much built this alone. And uh, in comparison for our XML-based UI components that implement roughly the same UI, uh, this took us longer and we had multiple developers uh, working on it. Uh, we can't make a direct comparison, but we can safely estimate that we can move at least twice as fast when we're building UI in Compose compared to what we did in XML, which is a huge difference. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to Philip, who is going to tell you more about our component design system and the actual encode details of our SDK. Yeah, uh, thank you, Martin. So uh, as Martin mentioned, we can move pretty fast with Compose. We're also much happier with Compose, uh, as we previously alluded to. So let's take a look at how we actually design our components, uh, why we chose this type of design, and what it does for our users. So. Because we have a very specific use case of having to provide a default implementation for our users. So our users expect something that works out of the box, something that they can plug in and have in their applications. But they also expect some customization, or actually a lot of customization. Uh, we need to find a fine balance between these two options. So default implementation and uh, completely custom UI. Because of that, we chose the following three component types. So the highest level of components are called screen components. These are complete out-of-the-box solutions that represent an entire screen, which means that you get to build an entire messages screen or channel screen within only a few minutes, only a few lines of code, but they do have limited customization. These are great when you want to test our API and just see if this is a good fit for you, if you can support your use case, if it's something that you would like to use for your application. Or if you just want to build a small sample project for yourself, if you want to play around with pet projects or things like that. So very good, very easy uh, to use MVP solutions. They do come with complete set of functionality and that is powered by our bound components. The, that's the next level of uh, component design. So bound components are called bound because they are bound to our view models. So they take the data and the behavior from our view models and connect to the actual UI. Um, they are also out-of-the-box solutions, but only for a portion of the screen. So, for example, if you have a screen that shows you uh, a list of messages, a way to send messages, and a header, you have three components there that are bound, the header, the list, and the composer. They are much more customizable because not only can you customize how you use them in terms of behavior and state handling and, of course, the view model lifecycle, you can also customize them and combine them with your own custom UI, meaning that you can build fully uh, you know, brand aware uh, designs for your application that uses some of our components to do the heavy, heavy lifting or the dirty work, so to say. The next layer or, or the final layer of components are stateless components, which are completely state driven. So they are essentially what the bound component uses underneath, but they don't use any view models. They don't really connect to any view models or know anything about them. They just get the state from them to show to the UI. Um, and because of this, they offer full customization. So not only can you customize where the state comes from, so it can be our view model, it can be your own data source. You can customize how that happens, how the data is transformed uh, or prepared for the UI. And finally, you can give that data to the component. And it's going to show the UI that affirms that data. But you can also customize it, again, as previously mentioned, through using that component with your custom UI. You can customize the state handling and the behavior of actions action handlers and things like that. So let's see how that actually looks like in code. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see our um, <clears throat> sorry, you can see a screenshot of what a message screen component or a screen component provides. So with only a few lines of code, only five or six lines of code, we managed to pass in a channel ID. Oh, sorry. We managed to pass in a channel ID to the component and a few other parameters to render a completely uh, fully functional screen that give, gives you the ability to send messages, preview them, uh, to edit them as well, add reactions, and so on and so forth. And if we take a look at the actual component definition, the only important component here is the, uh, or, or the only important parameter here is the channel ID. So the only thing that we need for this component to work is the ID of the channel you want to chat in. The rest will be provided by the system, by our internal components, and everything works out of the box. So it's very simple to use, very simple to integrate, and test if our API is something that is going to fit your needs. 
Moving now to the bond components, which are a bit more customizable, a bit more independent, and are, as I mentioned, are bound to our view models. We have the message list here, which is the message screen representation or part of the screen that represents the actual list, uh, sorry, the actual list of messages, the messages in the list. So here, if you take a look at, again, the right-hand side, we can see our uh, message list shows some attachments. It shows some basic messages, timestamps, avatars, and so on and so forth. It also shows you a button to scroll down uh, to the start of the list. So all of this is bound within the bound component. Uh, and you can integrate this with the rest of your UI or within a set content function just to test out how this component works. What's really important here with the bound component is the level of customization that we have. So in this case, the only important parameter is the view model because the view model connects the data operation. It gives you, the, gives you access to state. It also gives you access to react to behavior by uh, calling different functions on it and stuff like that. But it also runs everything together and kicks off the initial operation so you don't have to do anything yourself. So once you pass in that view model, similar to how you passed in the channel ID to the screen component, everything is going to work out of the box. The next layer of customization that we have here, uh, which Martin will uh, talk about a bit more later on, is the handlers. So here we propose a few uh, handlers for our messages, such as what happens when you click on a thread, long tap on an item, uh, and similar. Here, it's really important to see that we de defer these values or these Lambda functions to a view model. So everything is connected again out of the box and everything will work for you, but you'll, you're free to override this if you need it. And the final level, level of customization here is the item content function or the slot API. So here we can propose a simple Lambda function that you can use to override how every single item in the list looks. So it can be a, an attachment if you want to show attachments, or you can completely remove attachments if your use case doesn't use them or if your application doesn't have any types of attachments. So when we take a look at a few examples, with just customizing the item content function, the uh, composable slot API, we can take a look at the following screenshots. So the first screenshot actually shows the default behavior, the, the default UI that we provide. It's very clean, very nice. It has a lot of functionality, as we mentioned before, such as timestamps, different types of messages, attachments and regular text messages, thread replies, more information about the user, and so on. If you want to build a more simple solution, maybe you want to remove those timestamps, timestamps and add more colorful design to your messages, you can also do that. And on the, uh, the last two uh, screens, uh, we can see that the message list can be completely customized to something different, something very simple, something that fits your brand style a bit more, um, similar to, for example, a Slack application. So on the last screen, we can see that you can replicate the Slack design simply using that one single item content function. So this really shows you how customizable these items are because all of these uh, screenshots are powered by a single component uh, with only one function parameter that is overridden. And finally, as I mentioned, we have the stateless components, which are underneath the bound components, so bound components use them. They are completely powered by state. And here we can see the two really important parameters that we have in the messages component. So the messages component is uh, responsible for handling the actual representation of messages within the message list. We also have empty states, loading states, and similar. What's really important about the messages is that they have two parameters that define how it behaves. The first is the message state, which holds a bunch of properties for, for it to render UI, which we'll talk about in a second. And the second is the item content that we've seen before. So the composable slot API that allows you to completely customize items. So if you take a look at the stateless uh, part or the actual state for uh, the stateless component, we see the message state. We have a few groups of parameters here. The first group is the loading and pagination state. So these parameters actually give you more information if you are currently loading the initial uh, set of data, if you are loading more data, or if you've reached the end of messages and there are no more messages to paginate for. So for example, if we <clears throat> take a look at the is loading uh, flag here. If the flag is true, we're going to show a loading spinner for our list that is initially shown when we open a new channel. If we are loading more messages and we haven't reached the end, so there's more to paginate, 
when we reach the top of the messages, we're going to show a spinner again, which uh, clearly indicates that there's more pagination to be done. And then we load those messages and add them to the top of the list. Similarly, we use the message items property to show all the messages in the list. So in case the list is empty, we show the empty state, but if there are any messages, we show the loaded state. So here's a representation of the empty uh, empty state, empty list state, and you can override this view, the empty view, if you want to uh, show something completely custom to your design. And the last group is the miscellaneous group where we have a few different uh, properties that show different smaller parts of the UI. So we use the selected message to show an overlay. We use the uh, new message state, <clears throat> sorry, the new message state uh, and the current user, the parent message ID and under account for the thread mode and also for the Android message indicator. So based on your scroll state or if you've entered a thread within your conversation. So here you can see that if we have a selected message, we show an overlay that gives you several message options such as replying to a message or quoting it, uh, starting a new thread, uh, editing the message if it's yours or deleting it if it's yours too. You can also react to the message, which is really, really cool. And finally, if you have done any new message uh, or if you've uh, scrolled away from the bottom of the list and you have an unread count, we show the unread count indicator as well as the scroll to bottom button, which you can use to obviously scroll to the bottom and see all the unread messages that you have. So it's really cool because we update these two properties and the UI shows something completely new, completely functional that helps the user navigate the list. So those are our components and our component types. That, those are the levels that we defined for our components. Uh, and we, we are pretty happy with them. We are managing to build new features and new, uh, you know, different types of customization options for these components without a lot of issues or without having to rewrite everything. We just managed to uh, rewrite a small part of it or add a new property or add a new customization option to these components without a lot of work. But let's take a look at some of the common pitfalls that you might run into while you're defining these components or while you're building something for yourself. So the first thing that you'll probably run into as, um, as you work with Compose is thinking too imperatively. So if you're coming from the XML or the Vue ecosystem, you're very um, you know, hung up on setting listeners for different types of UI or setting the state, fetching the state from a text view and things like that which is very imperative, and this is not how things work in Compose. So Compose is fully declarative, which means that you have to define everything ahead of time. So just make sure that uh, when you're uh, using Compose, you don't really think about how can I set something on the UI or how can I fetch a component from the UI, uh, because you can't really do that. And just in, instead, make sure that you lay out your component design ahead of time based on the state that you have, and you should be good to go. In the same uh, manner, it's really easy to customize Compose components and Compose UI in general, but it's also very of providing too many hard-coded customization options for uh, your components. So if you're building some components that your users are, are supposed to use, you're probably going to expose a modifier parameter. And if you expose a modifier parameter, then you need to know that any types of uh, backgrounds, any types of uh, you know, modifiers that you set on your UI that are hard-coded will probably overwrite your user's modifiers. So in that sense, make sure that you uh, follow the modifier order correctly and that you don't hard-code too many options. Another thing that we mentioned before is that um, Compose for XML seems like what Kotlin was for Java. And when Kotlin first came out, people were really looking forward to migrating to Kotlin. But <clears throat> The problem here was that you shouldn't migrate everything to Kotlin, you should, or in this case, Compose. Um, you should slowly migrate. You should start building smaller components first before you start uh, building really complex UI. So this is something that's called um, a bottoms-down approach, essentially, where you take a look at the smaller details, the smaller parts of a complex UI, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you slowly build a more complex or you slowly compose a more complex um, screen component or something like that in your application. So start slowly, you can use interop. And then once you slowly migrate everything together, you can completely move towards Compose and build all the new features in Compose too. And, <clears throat> and the final uh, part and the final pitfall in Compose is that 
there is a bit of a lack of examples. So when you look at Compose and when you look at all the Google guidelines that we have, all the examples out there, they are very good and very detailed, obviously. But the issue here is that with design, you're never going to be able to have all the, uh, all the examples that you need for your specific design. So in this case, there might not be too many guides out there to guide your specific use case or for, to help you build your specific use case. And also there, are, there is a bit of a lack of best practices for Compose. So if you're currently new in Compose, if you're looking to test out Compose, if you haven't used it uh, before, then make sure to look to the community, make sure to ask for more guides, more examples, to look through uh, awesome open source SDKs such as ours, to see how we did things or other people did things so that you know how you can design your own APIs. And obviously because Compose is a brand new world, it's something that's uh, completely new, completely awesome, uh, make sure to explore a bit yourself because uh, you might find some best practice that works for you, but is not generally uh, out there because people have just found it, uh, found it yet. Now that we've gone through some of the pitfalls, let's take a look at some of our concerns that we had while we were designing the SDK or our components, API components. So the first thing that we were worried about is how are we going to represent dynamically sized components? So we have the avatar component that essentially shows from one to four uh, images of users based on how many people are in a channel. And the thing here about uh, XML is that we had to load multiple bitmaps into memory, create a bitmap, bitmap matrix, and then combine these bitmaps together because it was really hard to build this in, uh, in the view toolkit. In Compose, we managed to do this with just two rows and two columns and using weight modifiers. So as long as we put in the weights, uh, the equal weight for each of the images, and we load out to four images, the Compose component just knows how to, how to lay out in itself, and then we don't have to worry about dynamic uh, images or loading bitmaps or anything like that. The other thing that we were worried about is the message list optimization. Obviously, we can have thousands of users, hundreds of thousands that chat in the message list. And how do we form these optimistic updates or performant updates in general? So a way to make as, uh, as few changes to the UI as possible and uh, keeping the performance really, really good. We didn't actually have to do anything here for Compose. Everything kind of worked out of the box because Compose has a really good recomposition system where only the things that actually changed in the UI need to be updated. So the rest of it is going to stay the same and you don't really have to worry about writing specific opt optimizations here. Whereas for XML, we had to write a ton of diff util code. Another thing is the deep customization approach. So how do we approach customizing attachments, building custom attachments, colors, typography, and so on? Um, in XML, it was kind of all, all, all over the place because we had styles, we had attributes, we had some encode, um, you know, uh, view components such as recycler views and stuff like that. Adapters, diff utils, obviously, and we also had XML, which had its own uh, set of customization options. Um, with Compose, it really didn't, doesn't really have to be that complex. Everyone, everything is uh, a composable function, and everyone is using composable functions. And in terms of customization, we managed to provide a custom theme, a theme for our users that lets them overwrite pretty much anything in the app, uh, which Martin will talk about in a moment. So now that we've gone through some of those uh, concerns, we can finally take a look at how to make your components uh, a bit more readable. So one of the issues with most declarative UI toolkits is that they fall into the trap of deeply nested components. So components that have uh, several parents uh, or several, several layer, layers of parents and each parent can bring different types of attributes, different types of customization options, different types of state. This can co cause a component hell where you're not really sure where the source of truth is. So because this is a really big issue in other, other declarative UI toolkits, what we propose is that you move to a more flat structure with Compose and that you logically decouple components. So that the components that you use that you call in your uh, composable functions are actually uh, tied to a single state or a single uh, piece of information, single uh, unit of logic, so that you can easily call them and decouple them and use them in multiple places in your code. So let's take a look at what that means. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have our messages screen component, which is pretty much uh, the following code. 
we have a box that allows us to overlay uh, multiple types of components, one on top of each other. We have a scaffold that shows the top bar, the bottom bar, and the actual content as the message list. This is pretty straightforward. What we also have uh, after the scaffold is a bunch of uh, different types of states or overlays that are shown based on the um, UI state that we have currently available. So if we have a selected message, as we've seen before, we show the selected message overlay. If we are currently showing the attachment speaker, then we call that function. And finally, if we are trying to delete a message, we show a simple dialog. What's really important here to note is that all of these components are within the single line, within the single um, layer of components. So all, they are all within the box. And it's really e easy to reason about them. It's really easy to find that attachment speaker within this component and change its logic, add a bit, uh, add another component or, or let the user replace that component or something else. So it's really easy to reason about. And you can see the, the result here uh, that we actually have like three different types of UI that are all, all working as they are supposed to. So the attachment picker overlays the screen, lets the user select some attachments. The message overlay overlays the screen and lets uh, the user pick some options and add some reactions. And the dialog allows the user to delete a message. Now, if you were to take a different approach here, uh, a more uh, nested approach based on other UI toolkits, you could create a box which has a bottom drawer that you show as the attachment picker, for example. That attachment picker might uh, be animated through the animated visibility component. And finally, you have the attachment picker. So this is already three layers of uh, nesting just to show the attachment picker. Finally, you have the scaffold, which will have its top bar, bottom bar, the message list, and so on and so forth. And all of these parts will have different types of uh, components and different types of layering. So again, it's really hard to, uh, to customize this. It's really hard to find which uh, parent is the source of truth and how to change something and not break everything. So with that being said, I'll pass it over back to Martin, and he'll give you a bit more information on how we approach customization for our users. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so in terms of customization, our general approach, our mindset is, again, to give you out-of-the-box solution that you can drop in really quickly into your applications and they'll work uh, right away, but also to allow customization so that you can turn features on and off, you can change uh, behavior and appearance and so on. Uh, some things that you can do if you're developing APIs uh, to achieve uh, this kind of customization are, uh, first of all, uh, providing a modifier in all of your public-facing components that you provide to your users. Uh, this is actually something that's part of the official Jetpack Compose API guidelines that Google releases, uh, which is a really, really awesome document. And if you're building APIs for others to use, whether it's a library, SDK, or just a module within your own application that other developers and other teams within your organization are going to build on. Uh, it's really nice uh, to follow these guidelines. It's a long read and there's complex ideas in there, but they are really, really uh, well thought out. So uh, providing a modifier for all components uh, allows a really good individual customization, um, setting backgrounds, paddings, and all of those things on a component. Then uh, you should uh, think about exposing content parameters, um, slot APIs, wherever it makes sense. So if you have some large component within your uh, SDK that you provide, and you want users to be able to use that component but change just smaller bits of it piece by piece uh, on the UI, uh, then slot APIs can be really useful if you can int introduce them for uh, various bits. So for example, uh, for us, uh, we have a message list where users usually want to keep most of the UI but they might want to customize just some inner part of how a message bubble looks. And we want to be able to do that and slot APIs and let us. Then uh, while individual customization of each component at every use site is important, it's also important to give users a way to customize components globally in some way. Um, so whether it's the material theme system uh, that Compose comes with, if you're using material with Compose, or uh, whether it's your own, it's important to provide some kind of theming opportunity so that if you know, a user wants to change um, some kind of colors or shapes globally, uh, they can do that without having to remember to provide it for each component individually. And then finally, uh, providing customization for the state inputs and then the action handlers uh, of components is something that's a very core part of Compose. Um, so 
components are supposed to render themselves based on the incoming state, and they're pro supposed to notify uh, whoever is using them with action handlers about any user interactions or other events that happen within the composable. So let me show you uh, some of this customization that we provide on a specific component. So we're going to look at the bound version of our message composer, and we're going to look at three groups of customization here. So state, action handlers, and then finally the UI customization and the slot APIs as we have. So uh, starting with just the state. Uh, so as I said, we're going to be looking at the bound version of our message composer, which binds itself to a message composer view model, meaning that it will fetch data from this view model that it will display. And it will also forward any input data to the view model, as well as uh, actions, uh, which the view model will then turn into API calls and uh, talk to the lower layers of our uh, SDK that does networking, caching, and all of those uh, things. We do, of course, also have stateless variants of all of our components. So in the case of Message Composer, instead of relying on one of the view models that we provide, if you really want to drive this component directly, you could instead provide values such as the current input value as a string uh, to the message composer, and uh, you could render it uh, based on these uh, really like fine-grained uh, values as well. Uh, and as we mentioned previously, the bound component actually calls into this stateless component under the hood, so we have just one implementation, of course. Uh, then there are action handlers. So um, whenever something happens in the component, for example, the send message button is clicked, or the user types in uh, something, uh, then these handlers are going to be invoked. And if you use the bound components, we're going to default all of the handlers wherever it's possible to do to calling into the view model and performing actions. So for example, when the value of the input changes, we're going to call into the view model, and that will invoke our API and send typing events to all of the other users of the chat. Or when the send button is clicked, we're going to call view model send message. And that will handle uploading attachments and actually uh, sending the message over the network to everyone else. You get to, of course, customize these as well. So for example, if you call message composer, pass in a composer view model, then you can also pass in one of these handlers. For example, if you want to customize how sending a message works, uh, you could uh, replace that with your own arbitrary logic. Or you can do something like this uh, that we're doing uh, in this example here which is to still call the original uh, implementation here. So at the end of our custom method, we're still calling them into composer view model send message, which is the default as well. But before that, we use this handler to intercept the message and modify it slightly. So this is a great way to uh, add some extra bits of metadata to your message or to filter for things or you know just do any kind of pre-processing uh, on the message that you're otherwise going to send to uh, other users. And then finally, the last group that I wanted to cover is that we have UI customizations. Of course, we do this through modifiers, which is not even on the slide because it's obvious that we always provide it. Uh, but we always, uh, but we also provide slot APIs. So for the message composer, we have three slots. The first of these is just this attach icon on the left. Uh, we call this slot integrations. And our clients like to put various different features in there next to the input field. So a button for uh, you know, browsing attachments is the default, but you could also have a button for sending your location or browsing stickers or recording an audio message. And because we just take a composable slot here, you can pretty much provide any kind of actions in there, and you can put any behavior uh, in that area. Then our next slot is the label, which is the hint that we display uh, inside the input field. Uh, we could, of course, make this just a string so that you can change what the message is. But by providing a composable uh, Lambda parameter here for you, uh, you could also um, provide your own uh, custom styled text composable, for example. Or you could provide an icon and text next to it uh, in some kind of composable layout. So this opens up a lot of dynamic uh, possibility instead of just being able to change the literal text of the uh, hint that we have there by default. And then the final slot is to replace the entire message input field uh, as it is. Uh, we, As you can see, we call into something called message input, which you can actually reuse. That's a component from our SDK. Um, and if you want to reuse that, you can uh, bind it to the view model like uh, you can see here. But you can also modify a lot of the uh, different parameters of this view. Or if you wish, you can just build your own component that will display the input. 
And then you can call into the view model from that as well. In terms of theming, uh, we decided to go with our own custom theme instead of using Material because our design systems don't quite line up. Um, so the way that we do this is we have a composable called chat theme, which you have to place to the root of your composable hierarchy whenever you use our components. And here you can customize lots of different things. Um, so you can customize things like colors, typography, shapes, and so on. And all of this will be provided using composition locals uh, to the content lambda that you wrap with chat theme. And just to take, at, take a look at one example, we have this colors parameter here, uh, which is uh, of the type stream color. And we actually provide two sets of default colors. We provide dark and light mode colors um, based on whether uh, the uh, dark mode parameter is set. And you can also, of course, also provide your own. So if we take a look at this stream colors object, you can see that we have all of these different colors in there for um, various uh, text and backgrounds, and also things like the accent colors that are used in our components. And by default, we have some colors uh, in the two color schemes uh, from our design. But if you have your own brand colors, you can just take one of these stream colors objects, modify them, override, for example, the accent colors or the uh, background colors to match your own theming. And um, that will change every single uh, stream chat component that you use inside the chat team to actually use these colors, because we always reference these composition local uh, colors in the implementation of our components. And you can do the same thing, of course, for shapes and typography and much more. So with that, uh, we want to pro provide some resources for you to take a look at if you're interested, uh, first of all, in our chat SDK. So uh, our chat SDK is actually open source on GitHub, um, not just the source code, but also the entire project and its management and issues and uh, pull requests. All of that is happening publicly on GitHub. Um, so you can check out our repository for that. You can start if you like the project. Um, and you can also contribute to our Compose code if you want to. Uh, then we have a full tutorial for Compose, which shows you how to get started with this SDK in about like five to 10 minutes. You can get up and running with a new Compose app. As we've shown you with just a couple lines of code, it's really easy to get started. And we also have full documentation for Compose. So this describes all the available components, uh, how to use them, what the customization options are, and so on. And importantly, we're looking for a lot of feedback for our Compose SDK. We haven't quite stabilized the APIs yet um, because we still want to um, know what client needs are exactly for Compose usage. So if you can leave us some feedback on GitHub as issues or discussions, or if you can uh, ping us on Twitter at getstream underscore IO, we would be really happy to work with you and adjust our SDK. And then for learning Jetpack Compose in general, so we cannot recommend Google's Compose API guidelines enough. Uh, it's a really, really solid document and really worth learning if, or going through if you're building Compose APIs for others. Then there's Google's uh, general Compose resources, uh, which you can discover by going through their Compose pathway. And finally, there's a GDG YouTube channel here uh, where you can find a couple talks from Philip here. Uh, who has talked about both uh, beginner and then advanced usages of Compose. And with that, uh, we'd like to thank you very much for attending this session today and uh, listening to our talk. And if we have time for questions, uh, we'd love to answer a couple. Yes, thank you guys for joining us today. We have a couple of questions in chat, so let me read one of them. Vladislav Dokin asks, Hi, we are using design system and most of our UI components on screen is from there. Is it necessary to implement some percent of these components in Compose to start using Compose? Or we can use wrappers for view components and start using Compose for the new features right now? Um, yeah, so uh, my general opinion is that, uh, again, you don't have to uh, have like 20%, 40 60 80 whatever. Uh, you can start with smaller components uh, for your existing features. So, for example, if you have a list items or something like that, uh, you might want to explore uh, building uh, that in Compose. Or if you have very simple um, UI such as headers or 
bottom navigation uh, bar, something like that, then you can definitely replace that with Compose. So you can slowly add Compose to your, um, to your uh, apps uh, instead of just migrating a really big chunk. What I do also propose is that you start building newer features in Compose. So for example, if you add a new, uh, new screen to your application, uh, you can start using that uh, using Compose there and build that in Compose and like slowly start to migrate and learn Compose. Uh, but there is no um, there is no limitation as to how many components you have to write before you start using Compose. You can use Android wrappers and they should be uh, should be working pretty pretty good. Yeah, it it will really depend on the uh, setup that you have and and. Um like on the organization, like what the correct migration path for you is, if you do want to migrate to Compose. Uh, what I would say is that if all of your components are written in XML, uh, then like writing the screens that build out of those components in Compose might not give you a lot of benefit at first. So um, you, you have to see if it makes sense to have a Compose screen where all you're doing is like calling 10 different components with interop that you actually have implemented in XML. So if, if you have a lot of that interrupt, you might as well just stick to XML for the time being. Um, and yeah, I would I would first start by perhaps rewriting the building blocks to smaller components in Compose, and then maybe it makes sense for the screen code to migrate later on as well. So the main idea is to migrate step by step and don't try to migrate all at once. Thank you, guys. I think we have some time for more questions. And next one is from Mikhail Savin. He want to ask, uh, what about Lambda? Each time when you pass new Lambda to Compose function, how Kotlin understand uh, that it is different or the same Lambda? And uh, if not, how Compose understand that it shouldn't recreate cell in case of list, for example? Yeah, so... Um I can like try to split this up in, into two smaller questions. So first off, uh, how does Compose know that it shouldn't create a cell in case of a list? Uh, so if you're using the Compose uh, component from uh, the core, uh, core framework called uh, the lazy uh, row or, or the lazy column, um, the way that you build items is by providing some state and then uh, defining what uh, what each item or each piece of state, each object in your list, for example, or your set or something like that, is going to look like in UI. Um, once you set that up, uh, the list component essentially creates slots for, for, uh, for these uh, pieces of state on the screen. And by using the equals uh, function and uh, comparing the size of the list and everything like that, very, very similar to what the diff util does, uh, if you write it correctly, it knows that, for example, you updated the third item in the list by adding a small property or something like that. And then it's going to compare uh, the objects between the previous list item and the current list item. And if nothing changed there, which generally uh, nothing changes, it's just going to update that one item that you did change. So in that case, it's very optimized. Uh, in terms of lambdas, um, this is a bit of a difficult question. So for basic lambda functions, which are not composable functions, such as slot APIs, um, Every single time you call the co component, it is a new uh, Lambda function. It is a new object. So there might be some performance impact there. But generally, even if the recomposition triggers, it is not going to update the rest of the UI in any way because all the state that you use for your UI is still the same. Um, one suggestion, though, to try and avoid this and make it a bit more performant is to use uh, function references or method references. Because in that sense, uh, Compose is, uh, it's easier for Compose to compare these two uh, lambdas uh, and then know that the difference is like, not really there. Um, but for composable functions, for slot APIs and all that, uh, I think it essentially knows that it's a composable function and it knows what kinds of state is going to produce in the Compose tree. So it can compare between, the, between those two and optimize the list. So it doesn't have to redraw every single time. Yeah, in, in general, I think we can say that you don't have to worry too much about the performance impact of what you do in Compose because the uh, diffing capabilities of the framework are really, really strong and they are also improving over time. So everything's just getting uh, more and more performant. Uh, there are some situations where it's worth like aiding the framework a bit and the runtime a bit and uh, letting it know about whether it should recompose things. So you have things like keys. 
uh, which are uh, which you can use on their own as well, but especially within lists, they're uh, really useful if you're using it in a lazy list. Um, you can find a bunch of like advanced resources around this and how the internals of Compose work. Uh, there were some talks about it at recent Droid cons. Uh, you can also go all the way back to um, like some Medium articles from uh, Leland Richardson, who worked a lot on this, um, to find out how that diffing logic works. But in general, you probably won't have to worry about it for most of the time. So, like until you see some performance issues in Compose, I wouldn't dive too deeply into optimizing things in it because probably most things will just work out of the box. Yeah, a good example of this is our message list. Um, we only had one issue with the message list uh, in terms of redrawing, and that is uh, basically due, due to me writing uh, not optimal code. So uh, I uh, essentially changed uh, something to create a, an item within an item, which is a possibility, and should probably have like, like a link check. But other than that, if you're like just creating uh, items as you're supposed to, you know, for each object in your list, you create a new item. Um, everything works out of the box. And the message list that we have, um, we did some tests on it, and there are no frame drops on it. It is really smooth. It's really nice, uh, even though it handles even complex uh, attachments such as file attachments, uh, multiple images like in a gallery, and even uh, GIFs. So we have all of these complex uh, attachments, and everything works out of the box, and there are no performance issues. And we didn't really have to worry too much about it. We only added keys to our items, as Martin mentioned. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was really interesting uh, experience, and uh, I wish you best with your amazing chat SDK. And uh, I also hope that uh, people from our audience are inspired now to create their own exciting Jetpack Compose libraries, or at least try it in production. So now, we, uh, thank you, everybody, and goodbye. And we are moving to discussion zone.